15 years ago, Andrew Gauss explained the secret world of money. I just picked up the book again last night and read it. it it's reading just like it was written today. It's incredible. It gives you the background, and in a very simple form, the book's only got like 130, 140 pages, 138 pages to be exact. And, man, what he has packed in there will tell you what's really going on. This should be required reading for everybody, everybody. It's called The Secret World of Money. Uh, examine the start of money, bonds, the IMF, demystifies the Federal Reserve. He knows and wrote the book on the Federal Reserve that's neither federal nor contain reserves. All they do is print notes. When you're looking at this, his new book, Uncle Sam Cooks the Books, and the World of Money newsletter. The World of Money newsletter is an update on everything. It tells you exactly what's going on today. It too should be required reading if you seek privacy and safety for your funds. We're going to discuss the QE3, the coming crisis in Europe, and much more. Is this planned or is it happening? Andy, welcome to Erskine Overnight, my friend. Uh, hello, Erskine. A pleasure to be here. The secret world of money is just absolutely incredible because you start talking about the big problem is they issue notes, and notes is not really money, what we have going. And one of the key things that I found, of course, that came in under Woodrow Wilson and the Federal Reserve Act, but one of the key things is We've had two main things. They took the U.S. off of gold. That was under Republican Richard Nixon. And we had the uh, uh, the NAFTA and GATT and all of those under fiscal conservative Republican George Herbert Walker Bush. The Democrats tell you at least what they're doing. The Republicans are sneakier about it and seem to get more nasty legislation passed than even the Democrats. I have to agree. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, both parties need an overhaul. And certainly that Ron Paul revolution uh, is doing something to the Republican Party. I don't know that there's such an equivalent in the Democratic Party, but you're right. There's I'm not, not hearing person. anybody talking about the Federal Reserve other than Ron Paul, though. You're not hearing Romney talk about, yeah, we need to analyze the Federal Reserve. You're not hearing Santorum talk about it. You're not hearing Gingrich talk about it, Mr. Constitution. You're not hearing any of them other than Ron Paul talking about we need to examine our money because I think the most telling, the absolute most telling thing that could possibly be said about this was a quote that came from uh, oh, uh, old Meyer uh, Rothschild. And you've got that in your book when he said, Give me control over a nation's currency. I care not who makes its laws. Rothschild said that, the banker right. for the you're, you're world. Right about Gingrich, Gingrich, Romney, and Santorum. If you look at the FEC website, you'll find that the owners of the Federal Reserve banks are the primary contributors to those three guys' campaigns. So, you know, really? for them, they don't care. They don't care which one of those three wins because if they, if any of those three wins, then they win. Wow, it's like uh, my friend uh, from Alaska who was the senator up there. Like he said, uh, he said there were there were two candidates you had running. One was Hillary Clinton, and the other was Barack Obama. And he said it didn't matter. Look who's giving them the money. They're both coming from the banksters, and they're both coming from Wall Street. So what does it matter? And he was right. He was right. It didn't matter which one of those won. I saw the whole thing as a farce when you had Skull and Bones Bush running against Skull and Bones Kerry. Excuse me, what's the chance of that, Mr. Goss? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is no accident. You know, they've learned that they can control the electorate's uh, vote by simply controlling the primary. And so while a majority of American voters come out, the ones that do anyway, come out in November, uh, it's only the diehard party people that come out in the primaries. And these folks uh, are given a menu that gives them a very limited choice. Uh, and, and I think that's probably a good, accurate assessment that there was no difference between uh, those two candidates. When you're looking at the situation today, they have what you're calling the crowding out effect. And when I'm looking at it, I'm saying, seeing the lowest interest rates that we've ever had, but they aren't giving any money out. They aren't making loans right. to anybody. Lowest rates going, no loans going to anybody, and you're talking about the crowding out effect. 
Well, it's not completely true that they're not giving any loans to anybody. I see Wendy Mack, who is the uh, wife of uh, John Mack, who was the uh, president of uh, Merrill Lynch. So she had no public finance experience, but yet she came away with a couple of hundred million dollar loan from the Federal Reserve at virtually no interest. And they use that money, of course, that Republican, I mean, the libertarian maxim of whoever spends this new money first is going to get the best use of it. So what they're doing right now, Erskine, is they're, they're not giving loans to regular people, but they're giving loans to insiders so that they can go out and buy all of the critical industry and foreclosed houses and, you know, all the things that people love to buy. So this is really why there's a, a very low rate of interest. Why on earth would they want to pay you for your money when they can simply create all they want for free? And so this is the, the position that the Federal Reserve is in right now. They're creating money, loaning it to insiders, and allowing the insiders to buy up all of the critical industry and resources in this country. It's like what's happening with all the foreclosed homes, the millions of foreclosed homes that we have in this country. They've got about seven reps, which are real estate investments, uh, and they're all the ones that they're bundling them all up, and they're selling it to them on um, maybe 10, maybe 20 cents on the dollar, and they're buying the whole thing, and then they're going to turn them into rental units. They can rent them cheaper than the people who are in there because they're buying them at one one fourth or less of what they are actually worth. But you can, and I can't get into it because they've got it bundled into such huge numbers so that they can get rid of the inventory. From one standpoint, it sounds good, but from another standpoint, the John Q. public, the individuals just being totally aced out again, aren't we? Absolutely right. You know, uh, the idea of a Fannie Mae type organization came about as a result of the last depression. You know, they did this before, and, and Congress saw it. In the, in the crash of 1929, uh, the banks uh, simply did the same thing. They loaned each other money, and they loaned insiders money, and they went out and bought critical industry and houses and things. And so Congress decided to set up a national mortgage agency, federal FNMA. That was in 1934. And the idea was that they would loan money to individual Americans, and individual Americans could go out and buy their home. And it worked great for, you know, 50 years, 40 years, until they <laughs> privatized it. Once they privatized it and, and left the government co-signing, right, we were still the co-signers on all these mortgages, they privatized it, looted the company to the core, and then dumped the shell right back on us. So now that we have Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac back under the government's wing, instead of having Fannie and Freddie buy mortgages from the commercial banks, they should just let Fannie and Freddie issue mortgages directly to any taxpaying American person. And by doing that, I think they could straighten out the real estate industry in a matter of a year. But they're not doing that, and you've also got uh, outfits like Bank of America flexing their muscle again even though I think the bank is basically broke, flexing their muscle again and saying we're not dealing with F uh, Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. That's right. Yeah, they've decided they're not going to sell loans to Fannie and Freddie anymore. And I think Fannie and Freddie should just take advantage of this situation and put themselves into a prime lending position. So if they, become they really prime should. Lenders. Let's talk about this when we get back on Erskine Overnight with Andrew Goss www.andygauze.com Go up to his website. There's lots to do up there. We're talking with Andrew Gauze, and we were talking a little bit about Bank of America refusing to do business with uh, Fannie and Freddie, uh, the main uh, holders of real estate loans. And the fact that they're not going to do business with them, and I believe that you're going to see Franny, Fanny and Freddie going out of business before too long. They almost have to, uh, given the circumstances that they've been put under and the looting that's occurred within there. Uh, your comments on that, Mr. Goss? Well, you know, the, all of the, the bad mortgages and all the mortgages that these others, especially B of A and, and others, uh, didn't want to hold, they dumped on Fatty Bay and Freddie Mac. Now, it's going to take a while for them to work themselves out of it. I don't believe Fannie and Freddie will go bankrupt, although they're certainly insolvent. They're going to get money from the Treasury. And the fact of the matter is, Erskine, when you're creating money for nothing and you're loaning it to people and collecting interest, 
It's awfully hard to lose money in that business model. And even an outfit <laughs> it's like, like only, a, only a casino. How does a casino go broke? They've got the built-in profits, right? That's right. <laughs> and, and the same is true for Fannie Mae. So now that we have it, what I predict is going to happen is this, is that we're going to straighten it out at, at taxpayer expense, and then they're going to privatize it again. And, uh, the, you know, the idea that we should own a bank, which if you look up the American system under Henry Clay in 1808, you'll see that the three big planks to his system were, A, a national bank owned by the people, not a privately owned national bank. So imagine if the Federal Reserve was owned by the people. All of the profits that they made would stay in the Treasury. And then the second was internal, external tariffs. Uh, if you're going to bring uh, goods into this country and sell them, uh, you're not going to take the profits back home and build a new road or whatever in your own country. Uh, under the American system, you're taxed when your imports are, are brought into the United States. And then the third plank of that system was to take those profits from the National Bank and the tariff and use them for internal improvements, fix the roads, put in railroads, put in t uh, canals. That system worked so well from uh, the founding of the Republic uh, right up until the dawn of the Civil War uh, that I, I mean, I, I'm surprised that historians haven't discovered it again. I know that the mantra for every single candidate seems to be free trade, free trade, free trade. We don't have free trade. Uh, countries around the world dump their products in the United States with no tariffs and no tax, and every single time we try to export to another country, we're faced with uh, uh, burdens of all sorts from regulation to direct taxation. Did I ever tell you the story of the chicken feet Erskine? It's funny as heck. No, we, no, tell that a, story. There, we as a nation, you know, we take, there's not much that we can produce for less than China. You know, China seems to be able to make everything for less, cheaper, cheaper, cheaper. But one area where we are distinctly competitive is in this one little arena of chicken feet. I'm talking about the feet of little chickens, right? Now, is there a market? Is there a market for chicken feet? Not here in the United States. You know, in the United States, what they do is it's a waste product, so there's no market sure. for it. But in China, they make it into soup. It's a delicacy. They use it everywhere. And you know, whereas here in the United States, we cut the feet off a chicken and use the rest of it. There, they cut the feet off and throw the rest of it away. And so. And I'm exaggerating a little bit there, but, but here's the bottom line. Our chicken processors discovered this, and, and so they started packaging their chicken feet instead of throwing them in the dumpster, packaging them and shipping them to China for sale to the Chinese market. And again, it's about the only thing we can export to China. Um, what do you think the Chinese do? They slap a 105% tariff on chicken feet. So... Now, all of a sudden, an American manufacturer can't compete with a Chinese manufacturer. And this is typical of the trade treatment that we receive. They dump In the, in the enormous products. chicken foot market. Wow. That's, that's right. <laughs> they dump billions of their products here in the United States without any tax. And the minute we find a little niche that we might be able to exploit, boom, they throw up a trade barrier and throw up trade restrictions and tariffs. So to suggest we're living in an era of free trade is absolutely absurd. And if we don't get a hold of our, our policy, you know, we all talk about how government is spending more than they take in. But we're importing more than we export every single year. And it is this trade deficit. We haven't spoke of it in a while. It is this trade deficit that is weakening the strength of America every day. And we need to get a handle on it. Of course it is. We do think about it in terms of the oil and the importing, importing of oil, which we don't really need to do, but because uh, there's plenty of oil in Dakotas, there's plenty of oil in Prudhoe Bay. But we're also talking about this, uh, the whole thing on trade deficits, because you've got all of this, uh, the giant sucking sound, as uh, Ross Perot used to call it, and that's exactly what's coming back in his business, is this trade deficit. You just can't run run off of a deficit year after year after year and expect anything to come out of it. Now, Bretton Woods and a lot of these agreements, everything that's been put in was put in by the bankers. They put all these agreements in, and they also put in the fact that uh, money is created out of debt, and that's how they do their creation. But the problem with all that is that is the interest, because the interest begins to bite you. 
you got a country like Portugal paying 22% interest. You've got a situation like in Greece where they're taking over the entire country. The bankers are getting all of the assets of the country. They're just absolutely raping and pillaging, aside from the fact that the socialist workers of Greece were making unbelievable demands. But the fact of the matter is that the bankers have taken it over, the entire country, all their assets. They don't want their money back. They want the assets. When we're looking at a situation like this and what's occurring, it's occurring in the United States, too. And you talk about in the secret world of money that it's destined that no country has ever survived on a fiat money system based this way. It just is unsurvivable. You're just not going to survive. If the United States just says, we're not going to pay it anymore, and other countries in the world say, we're not going to pay it anymore, what, what will happen and what can it be replaced with? Because it's rapidly reaching a point to where there's no country that's going to pay it. The bankers are going to end up with all of it. And uh, I just don't think that uh, people are going to stop short. They're not just rioting in Greece. There's going to be rioting all over the world as these people, these bankers keep squeezing tighter and tighter. Comments on that, Mr. Goss, because this is a critical, it's reaching critical mass, and you say nobody, no country's ever survived under this type of system. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. You know, the reality is that uh, when we started this republic, we were a confederation of 12, 13 <laughs> independent colonies, independent states, sovereign states. You know, every one of these colonies used to issue their own money, and they got together with the Articles of Confederation and kept away from the federal government the powers of taxation and the powers to issue money and things of that nature. Uh, and this is the same thing that's happened in Europe. You know, because they uh, formed the euro, they let each of the countries keep their central bank and they let each of the countries continue to issue the currency, although they all issued the same currency, each country uh, kept its central bank in place. And then the laws that were made were made by each country. So it was sort of a pseudo uh, arrangement that wasn't really the same as, and many people wanted to uh, classify it the same as the United States. After we Let's talk about, war, about this when we get back. We'll take a short break. AndyGauze.com. IMF, which is going to be the world's central banker. Of course, Hillary Clinton wants to become president of it. Talking about what was set up over in... Uh, 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 the European nations where it's not analogous to the United States situation. There are two countries in the last few years which have their own central bank issuing their own money through their own treasury. We have a treasury department in this country, but they don't issue any money. Uh, that's all done by the Federal Reserve. All they do is uh, it has to do with tax collection and it has to do with uh, secret service. That's about it. You're looking at, it, looking at it, and you're saying, this isn't what the founding fathers had. It certainly isn't. You're absolutely correct. That's why Ron Paul's such a danger. He talks about going back to the Constitution, giving power back to the people. Wow, how dangerous can you get? But you've got two countries. One was Nazi Germany. They had to get rid of them because they had their own central bank. They weren't playing ball with these bankers. And the other one is China. They're not playing ball. In the secret world of money, and Andy Goss talks about what would have happened if Quebec had become separate. They could have become wealthy. They could have become rich. They could have were going to separate and not take a dime from the international bankers. What a unique concept. So they had to be squashed. Anybody who comes up about this, who tries to break away from the IMF and the international bankers, gets squashed. And the euro, they're right in there with the bankers. But when will the people arise? It looks like they're doing it in Greece. They're going to do it in other countries. And what happens if the United States defaults? Is this something that is in the offing? Because I've heard a lot of people say that we're in as bad shape as Greece. Comments on all that, please, Andy. Well, yeah, we're, we're pretty much uh, in the same boat as Greece. The only difference, of course, that Greece... Uh, gave up its autonomy. The one thing that they did give up, those European nations that joined the euro, was their right to create their own money. So they can only create euros within the limits set by the European Central Bank. So now, effectively, what's happening is as each of these countries is put up against the wall, you know, uh, Portugal, Italy, Greece, Spain, uh, one at a time, they're going to ab ab abdicate their sovereignty. They're going to essentially 
give their power to control the internal workings of their country over to the European Central Bank, the ECB. So what's really coming of this is the same thing that we experienced in that uh, post-World uh, War I period. We had a, a roaring 20s period of prosperity followed by a very severe tightening of the money supply, which led to bankruptcy across the country. And then out of that came uh, a national government that started with its FDA, FTC, FCC, and every alphabet soup agency that you can imagine, where the federal government took jurisdiction over everything that went on everywhere. That's what's happening in Europe right now. It's going to take them a while to work through it, but when they do, you're going to wind up with a central autonomous government in Europe that makes the laws for all the countries, something that they're lacking right now. As far as the U.S. default and bankruptcy, you know, the reality is that um, they're kicking the can down the road. Uh, we've all heard that statement. Uh, what we're doing each year is paying the interest on the national debt with the income tax that we collect. So just like any debtor, imagine if in your own circumstance at home that your payments that were going out to the credit card companies and your creditors every month were only paying interest. Uh, and then imagine a little further that you didn't have enough to cover the interest and pay for the bills in the house, so you started borrowing a little bit more each month. That's the circumstance we're in as a nation. How long can we keep it up? Well, until the people uh, uh, do something about it. And as long as we have, you know, Monday night football and dancing with the stars and, you know, the latest uh, tabloid uh, gossip to keep Americans distracted, and they're not going to focus on the important things like what Ron Paul is talking about and, and other issues. You can't keep it up indefinitely. Eventually, your interest rates are going to overtake you, uh, and the whole Ponzi scheme is going to fall apart, won't it? That's the theory. You know, the, the reality is, however, that as long as there's not something in limited supply that they're called upon to pay, and, and there's no limited or fixed supply of dollars, when you mentioned... And when Ronald Reagan took office, <laughs> we had $1 trillion in circulation. Uh, by 1990, there were $5 trillion in circulation. And today, there's over $18 trillion in circulation. So if they're going to be doubling the supply of money every 10 years, then what's going to happen is the value of your money is going to fall in half by every 10 years. So you can work your life away and put away a stack of Federal Reserve notes, and by creating more, they'll just cut the value in half. It's an invisible tax and nothing more. You know, when, when Ayn Rand wrote her book, Capitalism, Alan Greenspan uh, was not anywhere on the radar screen, and he wrote a little foreword for the book, and he said, at the time, remember, it was illegal for an American to own an ounce of gold. And, they, and he said in the book that gold was the only way to protect yourself against this sort of inflation, and that if there was anything else that was better than gold, then the government would make that illegal too. And I think those words now, 30 years later, make more sense than they did then. Every 10 years, they double the supply of money, cutting the value of your money in half in such a slow fashion that you just don't recognize what's happening. You work 30 years putting away a pile of money, and then when you're ready to go back to it and spend it, it buys half of what it did or a third of what it did when you put it away. What's even better than that, you're looking at the situation with the gold and uh, you're looking at the money and you think, well, the only safe place to put it is certainly not stock, so I'm going to put it in the bank. And what are they giving you, one half of 1%? All right. Why would they want to pay you for your money when they could create more for free? You know, they know that your money's worthless. They're not going to pay you anything for it. Uh, it's a harsh reality, Erskine. There's no way to avoid it. You know, I've seen... Folks make predictions of twelve thousand dollar gold and five hundred dollar silver, and I have to admit, when it was three hundred or four hundred, I was thinking, boy, these people are crazy. But now that it's seventeen hundred, I hear eighteen hundred, I hear a lot of people saying, oh, that's it, you know, gold has already made its run; it's time to sell. Not a chance. I remember from nineteen seventy seven to nineteen eighty was a big period for gold. But what many people don't know is that from the time Nixon closed the gold window in 1971, when gold was $35 an ounce, by 1977, right. gold had risen to $105 an ounce. It tripled about what it's done so far, quadrupled in, at current levels. So people thought in 1977, oh, that's it. You know, gold has gone from 35 to 105 I'm going to sell it. And a great many did. 
But as we all know, from 1977 to 80, that was the real period when interest rates started going up and gold went from 103 to 850. That was the real gains. And I think that's about where we are right now. We're in 1977. Gold has tripled, almost quadrupled. And folks are thinking, well, that's pretty much it. You haven't seen anything yet. I think you'll see gold prices uh, eclipse 2100 by the end of this year. And silver has an even brighter future, in my view. And all of these things are not the result of the scarcity of this stuff, but of the simple fact that the Fed is creating money at a breakneck pace they don't want to borrow yours. They're simply creating new money, and that's what's causing all these problems. Ask the people in India. Ask the people in China what they think about it. You'll certainly hear that. Silver at 3542 has a long way to go. Uh, more when we get back. AndyGauze.com. Andy Gauze has a special that you can get, and you can go up to his website, AndyGauze, G-A-U-S-E dot com. And or you can call 800-468-2646. This is a number you should have, 800-468-2646. You don't even have to put his name there. Just put down, call it, 800-468-2646, 468-2646. You've got a special going on where you can get the Secret World of Money, Uncle Sam Cooks a Book, and books and the world of money newsletter up there it's a terrific special andy well thanks i know it is in fact uh you know i this year is the uh 96 uh 2000 it's the 15th right you mentioned 15th anniversary of uh the world of money and so what i did was we went back and we revamped the book and we didn't change anything that was in the original 1996 version but we added to each question it's a question and answer book and, yeah, there's a great radio special. In fact, if you'll mention that you heard it on Erskine Overnight, you could take advantage of that special. And you get both books and the newsletter for one low price. So if you want to give us a call, you mention the number, 800-468-2646, and we'll be happy to send it out to you. The book is worth the whole price of it, The Secret World of Money. And I'm glad you didn't change it because that just shows how accurate you were because you made some predictions and you made a few things in there in The Secret World of Money about the future. If anything, you minimized what's happening, uh, if Indeed. anything. Yeah, now, the what we need to do and what you talk about as the pattern for what could be done is the Bank of North Dakota. North Dakota's prospering. The Montreal, the Quebecers, would have prospered if they had separated away from Canada and away from the Rothschild banking system. All of this can happen. We do have models showing it has happened. I think the whole thing's falling apart, but I think it's by design. I, I, well, I don't know. Is this by design what's happening? Are they just trying to just take over the whole world? Well, they have. You know, it's funny. When I hear people talk about uh, a new one-world currency, I, I know that we are getting a, a new one-world currency. It just won't be new to anyone in the United States. You know, 90% of all of the trade in the world is conducted now in dollars. So they, the Federal Reserve, have used the last uh, 85, 95 years to cement their position as the preeminent currency on the planet, and every time anyone is a threat to that, I don't know if you recall Saddam Hussein uh, suggesting that he didn't want to be paid for his oil with dollars anymore, and right. Iran suggesting right. that they were going to set up a gold force, and, and of course Libya is another country that had its own uh, central bank that was, of course, owned by the government, not anymore. Uh, what, what they do is obviously supplant these banks and set up their own institutions, and as long as the United States is willing to defend the right of the Federal Reserve to do this, then I think they'll be able to perpetuate their game by taking the wealth of the world. You know, in South America, Erskine, they've cornered all of the natural resources down there, all of the water, all of the mining operations, the phone companies, the banking systems. It's no wonder that folks in Argentina are firebombing the offices of Citibank because they know who's done all of this to them. The owners of the Federal Reserve, in case people don't know, we, we talk about it's a privately owned bank, but who owns it? That's what is important. 
And who owns it? Well, J.P. Morgan, Citigroup, uh, Goldman Sachs, Deutsche Bank. And they even cut in the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation. And recently, right. the Bank of China, the Bank of China, the, the Central Bank of China has become a part owner of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, thanks to Goldman Sachs. So as long as they're willing to cut everyone in on the action, everyone except the American people, that is, uh, then we're going to continue to pay for the freight on this system, and they'll continue to get rich. And these people don't play nice. When you're looking at the situation, what they're doing to Greece, that's the ultimate. What they're doing to them is what they'll do to any country. But you've also got, and you know, like you mentioned, these countries like Iran, Iraq, they go up against them and they squash them like a bug. They take them out and that's it for them, uh, Libya. But they also in the United States, politicians have come up against them. Five presidents, five presidents have been shot. You've had uh, Andrew Jackson, you had McKinley, you had uh, Garfield, Lincoln, and John F. Kennedy, all shot, uh, all but one of them were assassinated. And they all tried to change the system and go back to where they wouldn't have a Federal Reserve type system or a central bank. It would be a bank under control of the U.S. Treasury issuing money according to the Constitution. And they all were assassinated. Now, is that a coincidence, Mr. Gauss? I don't think so. I mean, I, I you know, there are certain conspiracy theories you can buy into and some uh, that you can say, well, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But you can only take a coincidence so far. I'm sorry. It can only go so far, can it? You're absolutely right. And if you throw one more on there, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, he absolutely started a movement towards getting us back on the gold standard. I don't know if people remember this or not, but you know, Ronald Reagan, was he appointed a gold commission. He ordered the U.S. Mint to start striking silver and gold coins again. In fact, in 1982... That was the very first silver half dollar, the George Washington half dollar minted in 1982. That was the first silver half dollar that we could buy as Americans for 50 years before. So Ronald Reagan made great moves towards putting us back on the gold standard. But I'll tell you, after the assassination attempt on him, he changed his tune. And, and I find most presidents who uh, even remotely touch that third rail and decide that you know, maybe we need to rein in the power of the Federal Reserve and take the monetary system back into the government. They're quickly voted to out of office because they're whining. Andy Gallus, I didn't realize that about Ronald Reagan, that he had uh, tried to bring back silver, at least, uh, in monetary form. AndyGallus.com. That's uh, where to go and to get that radio deal to say you heard it here, 800 468 2646, no matter where you are around the world, please get in touch. Go up to the website, andygullis.com, and get the radio deal. You will be extremely happy. You've got to get to the secret world of money. Andy, when we're looking at the situation, uh, my wife asked me a question. I know a lot of people out uh, in uh, uh, the country and around the world are wondering, do you go with gold or silver? I think silver's got more of an upswing. The only problem with silver, it's good for a small investor because you don't have to, you don't have to spend uh, $2,000 to get an ounce of it. You can buy it for $35, $40 an ounce. But um, it takes so much of it to be worth anything right, right now. Is it a better investment than gold, in your opinion, right now? Well, there are two ways to look at this. You know, uh, silver is primarily an industrial metal, and to the extent that we uh, recover our industrial capacity around the world, then the demand for silver will increase. Gold is a monetary metal, and to the extent that we lose confidence in the monetary system, gold increases in value. So I don't think there's a way to go wrong with either one, but you're right about the, the weight. You know, if you put $100,000 in gold, you could fit that in your briefcase and, you know, go through customs without any problem. If you put $100,000 in silver, you're hauling bodies around. I mean, that's hundreds of yeah, pounds. Yeah, you're going to have a hernia carrying that. 100 ounces right. of gold versus 100 ounces of silver weigh 100 ounces. It's like feathers versus lead, yeah. but the yeah, fact of know, the matter the, is. The, from the perspective of bug-out money, uh, you know, gold is the best. In fact, <laughs> the old American gold and uh, coins, the $20, the $10, the $5, uh, these are the best way to go for your gold purchases. Don't buy bars of gold or blocks of gold because 
that's a strategic medal that can be outlawed with a stroke of an executive pen by the president. Whereas money, you know, a twenty dollar gold piece from nineteen twenty, uh, you can buy and sell that freely, uh, unperturbed by regulation. And it's the really the last bastion of free enterprise in this country. So for me, I don't know. I like gold. I don't ignore silver though. I've divided my portfolio like seventy thirty. I have seventy percent of my money in gold, but I have thirty percent in silver, uh, primarily quarters, dimes, and halves from before nineteen sixty four. Uh, coins that I can use, God forbid, in the event of a crisis. If I need to buy a loaf of bread, I know a silver dime will do that. And, and a silver quarter, my, in 1964, a silver quarter would buy you a gallon of gas. And today, a silver quarter is worth $7. That'll still buy a gallon of gas and even have some left over. So that's the One of the way things you don't well. want to do, thinking, these ads in the paper that you see for these coins that are silver clad or gold clad, don't don't buy into that. No, stay away no, from don't those. Don't do it, indeed. You know, I hear I hear Ted Anderson on this station talking about real money, and and those folks are folks like that seasoned professionals that have been in the market for a long, long time. They're going to give you real value, real coins. These Johnny Come Lately guys that put an ad in the paper. They're going to try to fool you with a clad coin or a golden coin or anything but a real coin. Absolutely. If you want real gold and silver coins, you seek out an industry professional that's been in the business 20, 30 years, and you'll get firsthand solid advice and follow that advice. Don't try to reinvent the wheel. If you want to invest in an area that you know nothing about, you better find some professional help. And I'll tell you, there's, the there's great folks.